Okay, we're rolling. Okay. All right, back up a little bit. All right. Where's the wire? Is that? It's wireless. We oh, talked about this. Put it in your shirt. We didn't actually. We did. All right, Dad. Uh, today we're talking about these Sure mics. They're called Move mics. We comes with two of them. Today, we have two things for you. This and this. Obviously, we went for more of a Michael Bay level asteroid hit. But you know, go big or don't get hit by an asteroid. Uh, I don't like that. Like what? What you just said. I don't like that. It didn't make sense. You know, it does make sense. I'm sure it's gonna be something really clever. Well, no, I don't want to say it. The idea was always to do it in one, on an iPhone, with an actor filming in selfie mode. So once Shure reached out to us about partnering with these mics, it felt like the perfect fit, since we could be mobile and have better sound. So this is the very small setup we shot with. We have the small rig cage that we showed last week, then I have the Move mic receiver up here connected to the phone, and a mic on both Josh and Justin. I also had my phone inside of a waterproof case for this reason, but we'll get to that in a minute. We'll be covering a few things first, so if there's something specific that you're wanting to jump to in the episode, check the chapter markers below. But first, let's take a tour around the Move Mic. We have the Shure Move Mic 2 receiver kit here, which comes with two mics, a charging case, the receiver, a roll bag carrying case, two USB-C cables, a 3.5 millimeter cable, and two windscreens. Right off the bat, something that I love about these mics is how small and discreet they are. So many of these are bulky and purposefully call attention to themselves with big white font or logos. Whereas as this one is not only tiny, but it has no elements that call attention to itself. It's fully blacked out and in a form factor that allows it to stay thin enough to clip onto your shirt just like I have here. Which every bit of audio you're gonna hear from this episode is from these mics. You have just one button here on the mic holding it down, connects to devices. Pressing it once will mute or unmute the mic. And up here we have a windscreen on, which I love. Usually the windscreens are ridiculous and look like a leftover wig from a Dr. Seuss movie, but this one is just as effective without looking like I'm being attacked by a dust ball. So I had one of these clipped onto both Justin and Josh, then the receiver on our cage connected straight to the phone. Another really cool thing about these mics is that we don't need the receiver if we want to use the Shure Audio app. The mics can connect straight to the phone through that app. I'm not going straight to the phone here since I want to shoot in Filmic Pro to get the best image quality possible. So I do need this receiver up here since you can only go straight to the phone through the Shure app. To connect to the app, hold the side button down until the lights turn blue and red, then press this plus microphone button at the top right of the app, and it should find the mics immediately. Now that we're connected, we can rename each mic, then you can lock settings so nothing shifts, and here you'll be able to turn on and off your LED lights. Then you have high power, which just strengthens the wireless connection, and down here you can mute or unmute the mics and adjust the mic gain with this slider. Then farther down we have these presets, speech, singing, and flat, but you can also make your own presets. Then you have noise reduction here, which is pretty solid. Then you have a compressor with off, light, medium, and heavy. Then you have a high pass filter that you can either have off 75 Hertz or 150 Hertz. Then an EQ to dial in further. Down here, you have this record section where you can record the audio straight to the phone and it will give you a live reading of the audio levels as it records. Then you can go in, check the audio, make sure everything sounds the way you want, which it does. And overall, the app is great. Very intuitive with all the features that I would hope to see. But with all that set, I'm ready to shoot. Again, we have the phone in a cage shooting Filmic Pro. Josh is operating throughout and they'll be running. So I decided to shoot this in two shots. First is their reaction to the explosion. They run, then Josh falls onto this pad that we have set up. Then we left the phone on that pad for the second shot, which we'll be stitching into the first. For this one, we brought out our big industrial fan that we've had since UFO Yeah and a leaf blower. I had one on either side with a bag of dirt held with each, then two cans of haze. So on action, one person would be spraying the haze past the lens while the other two would be dropping the dirt in front of the leaf blower and fan to launch it past the lens as well. Then Josh crawls into frame to finish it all off. In post, I can easily stitch these together with a blending mode thanks to the sky, then fade fully into this shot as the final moment. And we're able to bring that dirt in early thanks to the blending mode to make it feel even more like one continuous shot. This practical element 
element was key to bring this all together for me. It's the last thing you see and it feels very organic and so hopefully leaves the viewer more immersed than you would have been otherwise. Since we do have some moments that admittedly take that realism down a little bit, like this shot here, you should be seeing the shockwave coming, but we ran out of time. So as always, wherever you can add practical to the digital, you know, do it. But that flying debris is why the phone is in the waterproof case. We absolutely blasted this thing with dirt and no harm was done, which is important because it's my phone. And since we shot this bit separately, I opted to take the receiver off so we didn't damage that as well. Then we recorded the audio for this section after the fact in our studio. And I was pleasantly surprised at the range of these mics. Josh and Justin went from regular talking to yelling and we had zero peaking. No cursing. I didn't set the two levels, and this is 24-bit. I just have the compressor on, and it did the job. And since I brought it up, let's talk about the receiver. You got a nice LED screen right up front. On one side, we have a headphone jack, a 3.5 millimeter output, and a USB-C connection. We have a built-in cold shoe mount that swivels, and a quarter 20 thread for more mounting if needed. We'll power this up by holding down the power button on the other side, then connect the mics by holding down the one button on the mic itself. Now we can monitor the levels and the battery for our devices. And inside the menu, we have all the same controls we do in the app. Game control, mute and unmute, audio effects like the different preset modes, noise reduction, EQ, compressor, safety tracks, and so on. And of course, with the receiver, you can connect to any camera, not just a phone. So right now, you're listening to the Move mic going straight to our Canon C70. And it sounds great. It processes nicely and feels more natural to me than others of the same kind, which made it great for our scene. I threw them on the guys and off we went. And these did an excellent job of capturing Josh and Justin's voices without the sound pollution all around them. There's constant planes, trains, and automobiles where we are, and it's a constant frustrating battle. But with this system, we barely had to stop. But with our our scene shot, it is time to send off to Thompson for the explosion goodness. Oh! Inside of After Effects, with the footage in a new comp, we're gonna start with a duplicate to key out the sky using Red Giant's Primat Keyer, which did a great job and kept some clouds in, which will help integrate the effect. Next, we'll track this area using Mocha up until the run begins, and then the track is no longer possible, and we'll have to do that manually later on. For now, we're gonna apply the Mocha track to a null and delete the unneeded keyframes after it's no longer tracking. For such a large explosion, we decided to look at CG stock instead of practical for the main body, and thought this this nuke explosion from Action VFX would work nicely. Plus, they offer an open EXR version, which we will use the isolated different layers. Now make sure to set your image sequence frame rate to match your footage, then add to the comp. Using the extractor effect, we can choose between these render passes, giving us different lighting angles as well as isolating the pyro. So we'll break this up into a few different layers, duplicating and choosing a different pass for each one. For the base, we're going to check Unmolt and use a tint effect, selecting the color of the sky and lowering the amount to give a sense of depth or fog for distance. For each extra pass, we're gonna to set to screen. This one adds some backlight, which will increase using a boosted exposure effect. Then the next is light from screen left, like our real world environment. Again, changing exposure and using a tint to lower saturation. And on both of the pyro passes, we're gonna use exposure, boosting one and lowering the other, and a hue and saturation effect set to the red channel, lowering saturation and pushing the hue slightly more toward yellow to make it feel like it fits more inside our footage. Now we're going to cheat how quick the explosion appears and we'll later hide the start with a bright exposure flash. So we'll trim the layers to where we want them to appear, pick whip all the above layers to the base explosion and link that to our tracked null. Next move the keyed footage above and reposition the explosion how we like. For some extra detail and ground impact we're going to add in a couple of these practical action VFX sand blasts similar to our dune explosion tutorial that we did this year. We'll place one beneath the explosion layers and another above moving it in the timeline, changing scale, position, and rotation, then slowing them both down to 200% before linking to the explosion base. Then we're going to use color effects to integrate them, then on the top version we add a bevel and boss effect just to give some dimensionality. Adding keyframes to the track manually can be difficult with shaky footage like this, but one thing that we found useful is to add a grid effect to one of the explosion layers and scale it up or down until parts of the grid visually align with parts of the footage we recognize. We went back and forth changing this scale 
depending on what was visible in frame, and you can also add contrast to the footage to bring out more details if needed. It still takes a while, but makes it easier to understand how the camera is moving. With that done, normally we would just enable motion blur with the standard comp shutter values, but with the iPhone, there is a distinct lack of motion blur, so we'll go to the comp settings, advanced, and alter the shutter angle and phase to get a slight motion blur, but not too strong. Then to add some light interaction at the start of the explosion, we're gonna duplicate our footage to be a luma mat using a tint and curves effect to crush the contrast and bring out highlights in certain areas of the ground. Then with an adjustment layer placed above the key, we'll link to our track and increase the scale to make sure it stays within the frame. With a tint effect, we're gonna make it a warm color, choose the new footage to use as a luma mat, and set the blending mode to screen. With a mask, we're gonna select this area for the light to be visible and boost the feather. We'll trim the layer and keyframe the opacity to quickly fade on, and then back off over time. With new duplicates of both the footage and warm light, we'll change the contrast to get more highlights on the distant ground, and Justin, who is naturally getting some light from the sun in that direction. And then we're gonna mask these areas of the new adjustment layer, keyframing Justin's mask to move with him over time, giving us this. For the asteroid, we also used an action VFX asset again, which had an open EXR version so that we can go through a similar process as before. For the base, we'll use the combined volume pass and increase the white point to lower brightness, then using a tint effect again to select the sky and lower the amount to give a faded look. Now link to the track, reposition, and line up in the timeline before duplicating for our emission. Set to screen, change the pass and white point value, remove the tint effect, and use the same hue and saturation we used on the explosion pyro. To add some more interaction to the smoke trail, we'll duplicate our footage and freeze frame it, linking it to our track. Now use a curves to crush the contrast, a fast box blur to soften slightly, and a mesh warp to extend to the top of frame when our track lowers the layer. Next, set the asteroid smoke to use the freeze frame as a luma inverted mat, putting the trail behind these clouds. We also also used an earlier moment from the pyro pass as an initial impact here. To handle glow on all of the pyro and emissions, we'll hide each of those layers, duplicate the comp, and in this one, we'll solo only those layers before dropping this into the main comp. We're gonna set to screen and use a set matte effect, choosing the key layer, effects, and masks, and invert matte to hide any sections behind the key. Then we use a few variations of Red Giant's optical glow effect and keyframe them to change over time, then altered for the smaller meteor emission and the two initial impact frames. To hide the sudden cut of the explosion, we're gonna add a very bright flash, which is often used to show the impact of such bright effects. So on an adjustment layer, we have a new glow and bright curves effect starting on this frame and keyframe to fade out over time. Another thing we sometimes see, especially with phones, is the auto exposure lowering to compensate for something bright. So with another adjustment layer and lowered exposure effect beneath the emission, we keyframe the opacity to change over time during the asteroid and first impact frames. We also found that fading in a spill suppressor to remove the blue from the sky and an adjustment layer fading on with a curves effect warming up the overall image help ground things and lean into an apocalyptic feel. For some final things, we added more rotoed warm sections during the impact, larger roll-off glows during these frames, some lens stock, and an angled streak using a directional blur on a duplicate of our admission, again, replicating what we sometimes see in phone footage. Another typical iPhone thing we wanted to replicate was this jittering lens flare we often see due to stabilization. We were able to get something similar by using the new Deep Glow 2 plugin, which lets you use a layer to texture the glow, so we used one on a duplicate and flipped the layer to have it move in the opposite direction. Then used a red giant camera shake effect to add that jitter in. You could add this lens flare in manually, but the good thing about adding through an effect is that it will change and update with your pre-comp. But with all that done, we comped in our practical dust pass and we had our shot. So there you have it, a big boom boom and great mic with a small wireless footprint. And I see myself mostly using the move mic for things like this or interviews, social content, and anything where I'm moving light and quick, but still need excellent sound quality. If you wanna check it out for yourself, check the link in the notes below. And if you wanna be notified when we put up new content, subscribe and hit the bell button so you're notified when we put up more videos. But until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.